pay your bill. And she put the money in an envelope and I went into the shop and in them days they used to have the TVs all lined up on one side. They had the same newsreader, you know, it's the same channel on, you know, so you see the same channel. And I got in the shop and it's sort of like, all of a sudden I just felt this sort of burning sensations in my ears, like heat in my ears. And it's sort of like, a, I can't explain it, but like a closing in, like a circle closing in. And the newsreader just turned around and said, the news is just for you. This 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 news is just for you. It's not just from here, it's from here, it's from there, it's from there. It's it's all around you and you can't get away from it. I even thought they were a sort of mighty gods who ruled the world and uh, sometimes picked some people to tease and uh, to control. Voice hearing, I think, is evidence of psychosis and psychosis is the big general term which is equivalent I suppose to to what people might say is madness we were in the gym at school and um, there's these ropes hanging up on the ceiling and I, I felt quite happy I, didn't, I wasn't distressed in any way and I went in the gym and I heard this voice saying Hang yourself. Do it now. Hang yourself. And it was so strong, it was so powerful, it was, you know, and so frightening. I mean, I, as a kid, and I wet myself through fear. I, I wet myself. I didn't know I was going mad. I, that, 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 actually, that never, I don't think I ever even thought of going mad. I just didn't know what it was. <laughs> People hear voices for all manner of reasons, but I, I think the important reason is that they're suffering from a mental illness, and that's an undeniable thing, and voices are a symptom, one of the many symptoms that people have, one of the more dramatic and interesting symptoms, but it, it's a symptom of a disease process uh, which uh, is an illness and needs treatment. That has been the prevailing view of psychiatry for the last hundred years, that hearing voices is a sign of severe mental illness. Most psychiatrists believe that the voices are delusions and what they say has little meaning. They believe the voices should be ignored and suppressed with medication. But the issue has recently become the subject of hot debate in psychiatry, with the traditional view being challenged. This film is about an alternative view of the phenomenon of hearing voices. In 1987, a Dutch TV chat show was to be the beginning of the story of a new approach to hearing voices. The show featured a young woman voice hearer, Patsy Hager, and her psychiatrist, Professor Marius Rom. Welke manier kunt u Patsy helpen? Kunt u er helpen, trouwens? Ja, de, echt helpen dat de stemmen weggaan, dat heeft de psychiatrie niet te leveren. En als je de medicijnen tegen moet geven, geef je zoveel dan dat dat feitelijk het hele denken alleen maar uh, zo versult, zoals je zou zeggen, het is een, som, een zombie word je daarvan. Dus ja. dat is dan, ja, dan is de, eigenlijk toch de therapie ook erger dan de kwaal. I was trained as a psychiatrist, like still everybody is trained, and that means that hearing voices is a defect in somebody's brain, is something which is put as a disturbance within the person and mostly connected with the illness of schizophrenia although we learned that it was not the only illness but in practice you hardly met people hearing voices not being diagnosed as schizophrenia so it becomes quite a kind of automatic connection between those two I began to hear voices when I was about eight years old and that was the age uh, on which I was severely burned. I, I looked at them as they were my friends because they were very friendly for me and told me stories and uh, had conversations with me, protected me from quarrels, kept me company. I thought it was uh, just normal to hear voices. The number of voices has always been the same. There were about 20 voices and uh, there were two or three uh, important voices who uh, spoke
spoke up all the time and the rest of the voices were behaved like a sort of back choir is that an English word? Yeah? and hummed and uh, when I was about 15 years old it became a problem uh, they turned to be nasty and uh, had um, comment on my behavior which was not very nice anymore they told me uh, n not to tell people about their existence and uh, also told me that I would be severely punished when I did so I shut up, I, I never talked about them because I thought their power was uh, um, stronger than mine Patsy was on the traditional route to the mental hospital when her mother introduced her to Marius Rom. Patsy was instrumental in changing Rom's mind about voice hearing being a delusion which should be ignored. Patsy challenged me to believe that she really heard voices. And I think the moment that she brought this challenge to my more conscious uh, was when she said you realize that you hear of you believe in a god in a church and you don't see or hear him and there are lots of people doing that and why don't you believe me because I'm hearing it in my head very intensive and that was kind of argument I said yeah there you have some argument why do I do that why take this difference I make this difference I give you a telephone number correlation in Utrecht Nearly 500 voice hearers rang in after the show, and 35% of these had no psychiatric history whatsoever. Research in America has found that up to 60% of people hearing voices are leading normal lives. Nowadays, when there are so many people hearing voices never have been a patient, then you get the question, yeah, but is it still possible? to observe hearing voices in itself as a pathological phenomenon because that's good as if everybody who hears voices is also a patient but if about 60 percent isn't then it becomes a little bit troublesome so i was very enthusiastic and told that colleague psychiatrist and then they thought i got mad so my enthusiasm had to be reduced a little bit i think there's a, qu a qualitative difference between uh, a normal person hearing uh, being in touch with themselves and this sort of alien experience of uh, voices coming from outside uh, being very foreign losing touch with reality and being psychotic which is really what it means but since the TV show seven years ago Marius Rom has continued to discover people leading normal lives who hear voices from the outside one of these is Lucy Berkman who recently heard the voice of her dead mother Rom invited her to breakfast. You had some years of a conflict within your mind, let's say, is this marriage yes, worthwhile? Yes, I think 10 years on? at least. Yeah. 10 years at yeah. least. Yeah. So at the, moment, at the moment you did not have a dis made a decision, and in that period yeah, it was your so mother experienced. In the middle of the day, I think 11 or 12 o'clock, and I, okay. I wasn't thinking of, of getting a divorce at all uh, at that uh, moment, uh, well, in that period, yeah. but not at that moment. And at once I heard her voice. Yeah. You got a little bit, oh, who's that, or not? Yeah, well, I had a feeling that someone was behind us, uh, somebody was behind me. Would she have been positive about it before? <laughs> oh, not at all, when she was alive, she would have... Uh, she would have think it, it was terrible to do so. She would have never agreed. I never agreed, oh no. So it was in fact a little bit a different mother this time. <laughs> it was a different mother, yes. Kindly, friendly, supporting. Yeah. I was so afraid that when I talked to uh, someone about it, they would tell me, well, you're a grow growing man, mm -hmm. you have to look and for help and so. Yeah. Mostly people aren't going to be enthusiastic. Yeah, hey, well, that's it. No, I, I didn't. I uh, you didn't, didn't talk about, about it. And now you have been divorced and you still hear these voices of your mother or not? I like to hear it. Oh, you like so to hear it? So I, I, I invite uh, her. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. the right word. I, I invite her time to time. Well, uh, am I doing well? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And 
It's part of my life. It seems to be very important that at the beginning of the voices that we heard from people who had never been patients, as well as people who have been patients, that the background is either a trauma or a point of no return. A situation in life where you have to choose what shall I do and the choice makes that you can't return on that choice. A number of recent studies have established a strong connection between traumatic experiences and the subsequent hearing of voices. Sexual abuse is one common trauma linked to hearing voices. Another, even more common, is bereavement. The last traumatic event I had really was um, losing my partner uh, who died. And I think that, although it didn't show itself as voices for a long time afterwards, was actually the, the beginning of um, a long period of coming to terms with that event. The voices being the, um, if, if you like, the um, whole event being brought back to me uh, in a very real way because one of the voices I heard was the voice of the partner. Um, she, um, she got herself into quite a state um, uh, and she, she actually killed herself which was um, was probably the worst thing, um, the second worst thing being that um, I was the one that walked in on her. Um, I think that hitting you and having to actually find the, some, the person you love dead, then you, you get caught up in all this sense of guilt and anger and, and all sorts. So, so I ended up sort of cutting off all relationship with parents and family and everything for quite a long time. I find it very difficult to accept an explanation of voices, that it's a buried experience that is coming back to haunt somebody perhaps a buried traumatic experience that then gets split off in, in the form of a voice. Um, I agree, and it's my very firm view, that voices mm. often have a very a, a worst fear quality, that it's the things that the person is worried and anxious about which affect them in this way. But I don't think you have to postulate that it's a, an awful experience which is being split off and, and comes back in the form of a voice. Um, I think that's an additional layer of explanation that we don't need. Schizophrenia is often caused by life events, life traumas, but it triggers a process. And I think that's the problem that uh, the, the, the psychological model fails to take into account, that there is a disease process which then starts running on. And even if you relieve the initial life trauma, the patient doesn't get better. I, I think when I was first diagnosed, I, I was quite relieved because um, then there was a reason for everything. There was the illness. I had an illness, it was treatable, and um, I thought nothing of that. But later on, when you begin to realise the implications of being called schizophrenic, like people's perception of you as a mad, axe-wielding uh, psychopath, or um, people treating you as a pathetic person who can do nothing for yourself, um, that changes, that changes into anger. Um, and then you end up being alienated within the system because you're called non-cooperative as a patient. Alan Leader's first encounter with the mental health system began after he was continually distracted by voices as a child. His mother took him to see a psychiatrist. He just sat there with a pipe and just... an empty pipe, always remember having an empty pipe and sucking air for this pipe, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Uh-huh. Mm. And I thought to myself, what is Pratt talking about? You know? This is worse than the voices, this guy. He's just sitting there, just he's patronizing me, you know. And he said, my mother, he said to my mother, I think this guy's got a problem. And my mother, I remember my mother said, Well of course he's got a problem, that's why we're here. You know, you don't you don't need you to tell me he's got a problem, that's why we're here. Mm-hmm. Interesting. You know. So the next thing I ended, after that is I ended up in an adolescent, in an adolescent unit in a psychiatric hospital in Hill End in St Albans. And, uh, well, my psychiatric career started, really. The conventional diagnosis of voice hearing by psychiatrists 
which confined patients like Alan Leader and Ron Coleman to mental hospital, often for long periods, is now being questioned by some psychiatrists influenced by the Dutch experience. They believe that the majority of voice hearers can learn to live with their voices, often with help from other voice hearers. Ron Coleman was invited down to North Wales by community-based psychiatrist Phil Thomas to run a workshop on hearing voices for a group of mental health professionals and voice hearers. If you think of the great diversity of experiences that people can have who hear voices, and they have a, an enormous wealth of different types of experiences, psychiatrists are actually only interested in 15 to 17 very narrowly defined aspects of that experience and they seek no further. They will not ask any questions beyond that, simply because that fits in with their own particular view about what the significance of that experience is. And of course that view is a fairly narrowly defined view that hearing voices is part of an illness, it's part of a, a disease, usually a psychotic disease. I'd like to welcome Ron Coleman, who's from the Hearing Voice Network in Manchester, and uh, we've come to work very closely over the last uh, 12 months, and it's a great opportunity to welcome him to Dog Eshly today uh, to talk about hearing voices. Thanks, Ron. What we're going to do is we're going to let you see what the voice hearing experience is like. Us voice hearers don't need to do this, because we know what it's like. Right. And how we do it is we split into threes. Two people talk to each other, and one person plays a voice, gets up close to the ear, and starts saying things. He's lying to you. He's lying. Turn away. Look, look behind him. Look behind him. Are you going to do something with it? What did you do with the camera? Yeah. He's not being you any good, you know. She's silly. Yeah. Don't be getting notice of her. It is very difficult. I think he's had enough. <laughs> because we're actually needing to do a certain amount of work in that meeting. We can't actually contract the business. Now put yourself in that situation. Well, it's not one voice you're hearing. It's two, three, four, a multitude. And it's not just for a minute or two. It's going on all day. What are the consequences of that? Let's start with your feelings. Well, how would you feel? Very confused. Yeah, confused. Mm. Frightened. Fear. Angry. Yeah, you get angry. Yeah. You were quite angry, weren't you, at one stage? Yeah. You get angry about it. Victimised. Victimised, yeah. Now, if you're feeling victimised, what can that lead to? Paranoia. Right. Yeah, you think you're off your tree. Mm. Don't you? you think you're mad. Mm. It's a natural response. You hear voices, there's nobody there, you think you're off your tree. Okay. That list that we've got. Confusion, fear, irritated, need to escape, harass, poor concentration, anger, victimised, paranoia, disjointed thinking. Where do you get that list? Where do you find that list? Or a list like it? Secondary symptoms of schizophrenia. But we were talking about consequences. Can't be both. Can't be symptoms and consequences. It's got to be one or the other. Consequence or symptom, chicken or egg, there's heated debate. But can research into the brain help us to understand what's happening in the mind? At Hammersmith Hospital, scientists have designed brain scanning experiments to investigate what might be happening in the brains of people as they hear voices. It will feel a little bit uncomfortable. The first step was to look at people who don't hear voices. What we found was that when normal people are thinking in sentences, um, which is a, equivalent to inner speech, um, the left frontal part of the brain around this area here uh, was particularly active. And this is an area classically associated with speech production, that is speaking out loud. 
So our study suggested that the same parts of the brain that were involved in speaking out loud were involved in silent articulation or inner speech. That is, thinking the words rather than saying them. One of the experiments we went on to do was to study um, schizophrenic patients who hear voices very frequently and we studied them while they were actually experiencing these voices and we found to our surprise that um, a similar pattern of areas were active when they were hearing voices as if they were external. Um, so that is we saw activity in these kind of areas in the left frontal uh, lobe and, and also to a lesser extent in the left temporal lobe and these are areas normally concerned with language. Um, so this uh, really confirmed what a number of people had hypothesized from a, a psychological perspective uh, for some time and that was that um, when people hear voices there may be a contribution from inner speech that is thinking in words uh, and we think that that probably does uh, play a part in the experience of hearing voices. Talking to ourselves, whether out loud or silently, is part of human experience. At Liverpool University, Professor of Clinical Psychology Richard Bentall relates this to hearing voices. This process of talking to ourselves is something which develops in childhood. When we're children, we learn to tell ourselves to do things and then to follow those instructions. In our adult life, we do just the same, although we do it silently inside our own heads. What's happening when somebody is hearing voices is that same inner dialogue is taking place, but unfortunately, the person who hears, hears voices is misattributing that dialogue to an external source. In other words, they don't realize that they are talking to themselves. They believe it's coming from somewhere else. One of the things we noticed was that many people who hear voices are advised by traditional psychiatrists that they should ignore those experiences, that those experiences are meaningless. And this seems to increase people's anxiety about the voices. I think that it's very important um, when you're concerned with helping somebody who is hearing voices to try and reassure them and support them and to tell them at every step of the way that they have got an illness. Um, that we are doing our very best to help it and that we will be trying to stop these voices. I'm also very clear that the first line of treatment when somebody is psychotic, has lost contact with reality, is hearing voices, is to offer them drug treatment, medication. The aim with the medication is to make the voices fade away. And very often, somebody who is experiencing them and who's talking to you about them will tell you that exactly this is happening. Sometimes the voices just become softer and softer and softer, and then a whisper, and then a murmur, and then they're gone. Sometimes they just go. Sometimes they're absent for longer and longer periods, and, and then they gradually just fade away. None of the, none of the medica medication I've ever received has ever affected the voices. And I told them that, and they said, well, give it time. Well, how, how, how long do you give it? 20 years? You know, time is... <laughs> no, it's never, it has never, ever affected the voices. And I told them that. It made me ill. The, the medication actually made me physically ill. I woke up one morning, and I... I thought clearly to myself, that's it, I've had enough. The voices are still there, whether I take the medication or not. I'm going to stop pitying myself, being a victim, if you like and start doing something about it. I think that's when I changed. And that was the day I stopped taking the medication. I just said no more. And I haven't taken any since then. And that's well over a year now, it's about 18 months, well, 16 months. One often needs medication in order that the, the individual's anxiety is reduced to such a point that they can usefully focus on really what a very difficult and in themselves distressing issues to have to deal with. So I think medication has a very important role to play in this process, but it has to be seen in its context. It has to be seen that it is not the only thing that the patient is offered. I was in a Hackney hospital and um, they had done everything for me. They could, they gave me, they'd done everything to me. They gave me the EC, they gave, I had ECT before, but I had Monica and Dipixol and a combination of drugs. And this new nurse 
Um, I don't know what it was. I think they called it behavioural therapy in the I don't know if it was, but she was just new, she was just starting, she was interested in that, and she was on a group, and, I, and, she, and she offered to see me, and, um, and at first I was really sort of cut off, I didn't want to talk to her, you know, she sat there and I said, yeah, I have the session to end, you know. <laughs> You know, you can talk to me, but I ain't going to talk to you, sort of thing. Because I knew if I talked to her, what would happen is I'd get in more trouble, you know. But, um, she, I said, she said, well, what's the problem? I said, well, you know, I hear voice. And she goes, I always remember it. She goes, I said, what? what? What's the big deal about that, you know? She said, I like it. So coping. I don't get really angry with her. I said, what do you mean, so what? I'm schizophrenic, you know. I'm, you know, you'd care for me, you know. <laughs> You've got to care for me, you know. And she goes, well, why? Can't you care for yourself? That triggered it. That started triggering my own thing about coping and um, dealing with it. <laughs> Alan Leader's psychiatric career lasted nearly 20 years before he started to find ways of coping with the voices outside of institutions and without medication. Now he's bringing up a family and has a job as a community care coordinator in a London borough. For me, the best form of therapy, the best form of therapy is, is, is liberty, is to be able to, to hold a job, to have a, have a family, to have a house, to have food, to have housing, to have secu comfort. When I was in the hospital, I was trying to focus, there's this um, theory about focusing, where you actually focus on the voices and you look away of trying to control your voices by focusing. The car this carving is basically um, the one of the voices. Now the carving is not the voice. I mean that's a, <laughs> yeah, it, this doesn't talk to me, it doesn't whisper in my ear, you know, I don't have really visions of this getting up in the night and walking around and whispering to me. I think that's important, but it was just a way of yeah, for me to focus on, to visualise how I felt about the voice, what the what the voice represented to me. It represented as being squatted up and as you can see it's holding on tight, you know, and um, thinking uh, it's funny it's sort of very thoughtful and it's very very powerful and and what I do with it sometimes I am um, I mean I do hide it, you know. I do hide this thing. Um and sometimes I I look at it, sometimes I just talk to it. But I'm not talking to it, I'm talking to the voice. Alan Leader has also done paintings that represent his voices as a way of focusing on them. Another form of focusing is the idea that people should pay detailed attention to every aspect of their voices. It's an approach that's been developed by Richard Bentall. We start off by getting people to listen to uh, aspects of the voices which are not particularly challenging. So, for example, the tone of the voice, where the voice seems to be coming from, um, how loud the voice is, in other words, the physical characteristics of the voices. And when they've become used to doing that and for short periods of time, first of all in therapy sessions, but also as homework afterwards. Um, when they become used to listening to the physical characteristics of the voices, we get them to listen to the content of the voices. Um, and to start to consider in what way the content of the voices reflects things which have happened to them in the past, in what way the content of the voices might be considered to be important information which they might be able to make use of, uh, and in what ways they can understand um, what the voices mean particularly for them? I think voices are evidence of brain dysfunction whether they're so-called good voices or so-called bad voices and I would always challenge that alternative reality and try and bring somebody back to normality. I think the main reason I would do that if the voices are good and comforting is because in my experience they don't always stay that way and I think if you're allowing somebody to, to feel that this is reality for them and then that changes to become menacing, um, then they can be much more frightened and need a lot more reassurance later on. I don't think it's true that to listen to people's voices um, is simply to uh, collude with some kind of delusional system which they have. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think that when patients come to see that the voices are connected to their life experiences, very often they can either cope with the voices better or sometimes they're actually able to see that the voices are in fact their own inner voice speaking to them. Um, and that's a positive thing. Either of those developments is a positive thing. 
Um, so I can't quite see why anybody would believe that uh, paying attention to the content of somebody's voices is a dangerous thing. Society's worst fears about voice hearing relate to the very small number of cases in which someone hears a voice that instructs them to act violently towards somebody else. I had a small cleaning job and I used to go clean at this private house. And one day I was there cleaning and I was vacuuming up. Uh, and I heard this voice, sort of like a, a thought, you know, not an actual voice. And it said, who's she? Then a moment later it's, it began to talk to me again and it said, um, you don't know who you are, do you? And uh, I was thinking at the time of furniture polish, <laughs> what room I was going to clean next. And uh, it didn't fit into my thought pattern at all. And uh, I can remember thinking, what is this, you know, what is this happening to me? I was in utter despair about myself and confusion, you know. Uh, and there were situations in my life at that time I was having problems um, with my older children uh, and with my husband. And... Um, the, the feelings that were there underneath uh, about my neighbour were feelings of anger, what I'd subdued, and I tried to be a nice neighbour. And this anger come from nowhere, um, just in my very being, you know, towards her. Over a, a matter of months, uh, things have been happening, like a dog was coming round and we've seen all over the garden, and I had small children and I was worried about it. The voices sort of said, you know, you know what she's like. Um, if you don't do anything, your children could become ill with this, um, you know, muck that's around and various other things. And they made me feel inadequate as a mother because I'd let it go. Uh, and they were on and on at me constantly, um, solid for about 24 hours. I didn't get any sleep uh, until um, the following day they were on at me again and again. And then finally in the early hours of the morning I went round, you know and uh, smashed the windows and hurled abuse and become very violent and everything, you know, which really wasn't me. You know, I, I didn't have any sense as though I were in control. Uh, and then there was this sudden realization of, oh my God, you know, what have I done? Susan Clarkson was arrested later that night and spent some weeks in a psychiatric hospital. If she'd had the chance to talk about her voices before things had got out of hand, could events have taken a different course? The, the danger always is that people say, yeah, when people want to kill somebody, and the voices tell him to kill somebody, I think the best thing is to accept that the person has a voice and who tells him to kill a person. Because if I talk about that, we can also talk about how to prevent that that happens. Because the person also says, it's not me telling me to kill somebody, but it's somebody else. So we acknowledge that it's somebody else, so that it's very important to get much more defense against that other person in your head who tells you to kill. And in that sense, we can make a joint venture to prevent that the killing, in fact, happens. If we don't do that, the voice keeps on telling that he has to kill, and then this person lives in a, on a falconer, which on a certain moment might get out of control, and then he kills somebody. So not talking is much more dangerous than talking. I have never met somebody who did some aggressive things after explorative talking about it, but always with people who never got the chance of talking. I think messages that people, when people are severely ill and have messages that they should harm someone else or kill somebody else, I think that that is a very serious area indeed. And I don't believe that relying on psychological intervention um, is a very good thing at all. I would be very worried trying to persuade somebody that they shouldn't do it by exploring their voices. Um, because I think that alternative reality is something that we 
we're not there with the person. We don't know what's affecting them from minute to minute. And while you might well be able to persuade somebody that really they don't need to, to kill their mother, if you're leaving them alone with their mother then for weeks on end, um, the alternative reality may well come back in, in full force and your words of, of advice and an explanation m may be gone. So I think it's a very serious area indeed. It's two years since Susan Clarkson left hospital. She's actively trying to promote awareness and understanding about voice hearing in her area. And the hospital now refers voice hearers to her for support. Does she understand now what drove her to act as she did? A lot of the emotion was the frustration um, and the desperation of not knowing if it was real, what was real and what wasn't real. Um, because I, w I knew it was real, that the voices were real. I never doubted that they were real because our experience of them. Uh, I know that sounds pretty bizarre, but I mean, when you're experiencing something, you know that it's real, whatever level people want to measure that. Uh, and this was. Um, and I just, nobody would understand or take it on board. Uh, and that's really when the desperation set in. If I'm confronted with a patient who says, and I have been confronted with patients who say uh, that the voice, for example, is asking them to assault somebody or attack somebody or perhaps even kill somebody, then uh, I can pay attention to the voice and I can encourage the patient to pay attention to the voice without encouraging them to do what the voice says. Um, an important th point to make to people who hear voices, I think, under these circumstances, is that there's a difference between um, understanding the content of one's own thoughts and where one's own thoughts come from and just following them. If the debate about how to treat voice hearers seems polarised between those who favour talking and those who favour medication, in practice there are psychiatrists like Bill Thomas who are trying to reconcile the two approaches. Bill Thomas has been putting into practice some of Richard Bentold's ideas about focusing through therapy sessions with a patient called Peg. Peg's problems appeared to stem from how she felt about looking after her elderly parents. When the voices really started causing a great deal of distress, what, what happened? What form did the voices take at that time? They directed me in what to do in the situation, how to cope with it. But my way of coping wasn't really acceptable to society. There was one episode where you were in the car with your father and you felt that there was something strange happening to your thoughts. At the yes, time. I did. Things got out of control and I just saw a tree and I thought, I'm, I'm going to do it go for that tree. I got to get rid of him. Right. And I don't know how I missed it. How, how do you see the sorts of processes that led up to you not being able to cope with the voices? I think I was so involved in my work and then at the same time I had elderly parents who needed a lot of help and I, I never went away and recharged my own batteries. And you see, I was happy with my voices and when they told me to do something, I didn't see anything wrong in it at all. It was other people perceived it as wrong, right. but to me it was the answer. What is your explanation of the voices? How do you understand that? I think I was out of control. Because when I was in my right mind, I could see that it just wasn't on. But at the time, I was completely convinced by them. Now. Can, what to you then is the difference between being in your right mind and being out of control? How, how do you see the difference between those two states? Well, in, the, in my right mind I can reason. But when I'm hearing my voices, 
I feel with them and I act. I don't stop and think it out. Right. right. It was enormously difficult for Peg to start on this process. Um, she had been very comfortably adjusted to the whole idea that she was a schizophrenic, that she would need medication for the rest of her life. That has to be respected, uh, and it's not my place to go changing that willy-nilly. On the other hand, it's clear that she wanted to understand more about the voices and, and what the voices meant to her. So really, what we're having to do is to try to run two models simultaneously keep medication going she gets a lot of benefit from medication she feels more confident taking medication she f and that in is important because it means that it's possible for her then to start exploring the emotional and psychological significance of the voices which is what we're doing so we're really trying to run two models simultaneously but I think over a period of time hopefully one model the psychological model will supplant the medical model. One idea common to all the new approaches to voice hearing is to encourage people to talk about what their voices are saying. Joining a voice hearers group can be a first step. Ron Coleman's visit to North Wales has helped voice hearers to form their own group where they can talk about their experiences. I only hear these voices in my flat. And they happen to be Chinese. <laughs> And, and I don't believe it's in my head, but everybody else does. Um, I don't know whether anybody else hears voices in everywhere, but I... I, I hear them in certain, certain uh, places, but not in other places. It's, it just happens to be where I am. When I lived in Birmingham, I didn't, I've never heard any voices there. Sometimes... I can laugh and joke about it, but other times it does get on you, gets you down. Depends on what sort of a mood I'm in, and I make a joke out of it, but you can't always do that, can you? Have you got the voices all the time, or does it come and go? Y yeah, but I, um, I can tell my voices to leave me alone until I'm ready to speak to them. Yeah. Uh, which I tend to do at night. Yeah. Uh, for about an hour. Because I tend to, I hear these voices, and uh, if I put the radio on, or put the television on, I kind of drown the the voice. Yeah. But it tends to get louder then. Yeah. You know, as if, as if something is, is being switched up, and I'm trying to say that it's not in my head, oh, that somebody else is I switching things on. I hear them over the television as well. Yeah. I guess in fury issue and it's you know you, you can't get rid of them and when I go when I go to bed they're there and the first thing I hear in the morning yeah are them <coughs> did you find that you got aggressive towards when you tried to sort of explain it to someone that you got aggressive because they didn't believe you yeah especially in Skype because I kept on saying it wasn't really happening ignore it and it'll go away yeah and I was thinking, it's not going to be. Yeah. So yeah, you do get angry, but I think that anger sometimes is justified. Yes. Um, yeah. It's... I think to deny anybody's experience has been to create anger. It seems to me, really, that um, one thing that the Hearing Voice, Hearing Voice Network is saying is that these are our experiences. For God's sake, treat them with respect. And what we have to do is to say to people who hear voices, here you are, they're your experiences, let's see what sense you can make out of them with our help. For the majority of voice hearers, sharing experiences in a group is an important first step in coping. Finding ways of managing the voices is the next. The other thing I would say to people is to tell the voices to don't go away shut up um, you know come back at four you know uh, come back at four four I'm busy now you know you, know, you can't do it. you don't think I notice all the time but I mean uh, but just doing that just actually owning the experience and saying well okay no no look, look now you know I've got guests here you know <laughs> or I go to work I'll go into my, into my washroom toilet room and say whoa you know shut up 
No, we've got uh, some from social services here now. It's not, not appropriate to, you know. <laughs> what, what now? Thank you. <laughs> In the evening after eight o'clock, I set my mind open to the voices, they could talk to me, and all my um, attention was uh, focused on the voices. They could talk to me until I went to bed, and then the effect of that was that they wouldn't bother me anymore so much during the daytime, and I could do my, well, normal things during the daytime and take care of my household and my children. Although the debate about the causes of voice hearing seems at this stage to be unresolvable, there is no question that many people who hear voices have succeeded in finding ways to live with them. But nobody's suggesting that it's always easy. Well, there's a robotic voice. I don't mean a dialect type voice. You don't talk like, hello, how are you, that kind of voice. It's, it's precise. It's cold. It's still like, and it, you know, I, every time I think of it, I think of factories and sh and uh, trains going up and down and and, uh, and coldness and no human beings at all, no no flesh, no blood, no just just coldness, just mechanical. That that voice is the most powerful one of all because it's I can't explain it, but I feel it. I not only do I hear it, I feel it. It's like someone going out to you and gripping you by the stomach and whipping you like that. It really is, makes you feel sick. You know, it, 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 oh, it's frightening. I got off a bus, we were meeting, we were eating Karen, um, got off the bus, it was like a panic attack, you know, hot, heat, yeah? Temperature rising, you know, like that, and froze. And it said, jump in the road, jump in the road, jump in the road. <laughs> That is the most frightening boss of all, and uh, the, other, the others I'm, the others I'm, I've got, I've got a rapport with, you know, I, I feel I've been in some kind of relationship with him. That one is wild, you know, that one didn't like the filming at all, didn't like the, the, the idea of the camera here, and didn't like the idea of being involved in this programme.